the name of the one triune God. Amen. Please be seated. And suddenly from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. And all were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Is our God not an awesome God? You know, friends, outside of the birth narrative of Jesus, this story that we heard this morning from the Acts of the Apostles, it marks the beginnings of the early church and is probably one of the most familiar narratives of all. Each year we hear it retold again, and yet it's often hard to remember what exactly was happening in Jerusalem that morning. This was not business as usual. Can you imagine Jesus' friends and followers gathered upstairs in a room in Jerusalem? This ragtag and mournful band wanting to support each other, waiting as Jesus had instructed them to stay here in the city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. And I imagine that they were perplexed and confused and maybe a little scared of what was happening all around them and what the future would hold. I bet they were more than just a little worn out from waiting. You see, it had been seven weeks since their friend and leader had died and resurrected, almost two months, and they were still waiting. They might have been getting impatient, much like a child gets impatient, waiting for a parent to return home from work or from a business trip. And it wasn't like it was a quiet time in Jerusalem, because on this particular day, the city was really crowded. It was the festival of Shuvat, or Pentecost, as it would become known later. It was the third of three great festivals observed by devout Jews, and it marked the celebration of the giving of the Torah, in particular, the giving of the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai after the exodus of the Jewish people from Egypt, where God claimed them as God's people. And so because of this festival, devout Jews from all over the empire and immigrants living in Jerusalem They were gathered in the city that day for this festival. I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I want you to hear the chaos. The voices. The smells. Women shopping for dinner. The animals making noises waiting to be sacrificed. The sounds of different languages. And then, just as Jesus had promised, the fireworks began and God blew in and lit up this simple group of followers. And life would never be the same. And that same wind that blew in the beginning the same Holy Spirit that anointed and animated Jesus and united him to God the Father and empowered him to be fully human and fully divine, the image of God, was shared with each one of his followers. And they were filled with so much power that these simple Galileans began to speak in a cacophony of the many languages of the city and of the world. And they weren't speaking in tongues or some special spiritual language or in some kind of gobbledygook. But 
the native languages of those people in Jerusalem. And not one of them had been to linguistic school or experienced the Rosetta Stone or the Berlitz language CDs. Some of these apostles may not even have been able to read. And yet, empowered by the Holy Spirit, this new community, this new church, was able to bear witness to the power of God in the languages of the people. And so on Pentecost, Christianity, the way, this new church, it became divinely sanctioned to translation and multilingualism, a foreshadowing of things to come. Because when you think about the Hebrew scriptures, they're read in Hebrew. When you think about the Quran, it's read in Arabic. And yet the Christian gospels are read in the language of the people. What a day that must have been. God certainly knows how to make an entrance. Writer Annie Dillard in her book Pilgrim at Tinker Creek says this, Our creator loves pizzazz. And that is what the followers of Jesus needed that Pentecost day. They needed a dose of pizzazz. Something to fire them up. Because not everybody was happy about what was happening. Some were ready to attribute all these languages they were speaking to religious ecstasy or even drunkenness. But Peter, one of the most cowardly on the night of Jesus' arrest, the denier, he embodies the power of the Spirit and states the true meaning behind this multilingual display that Pentecost had produced. Peter cites the profound inclusivity of the prophet Joel as he becomes a vital witness for the gospel. Young men will have visions. Old men will dream dreams. Slaves, both men and women, will prophesy. He was a vital witness. And this same spirit, this paraclete that fired up the early church, that energized Jesus' followers to live differently, to care for one another, to offer a beacon of hope to a world in desperate need, is the same spirit that is with us here today and forever, as Jesus had promised in John's Gospel. In this spirit, she continues to prod and cajole and beckon forward our church. And now more than ever, we need this power to make our world safe for all God's children. We need this power if we're going to be a community that brings life, joy, and fulfillment to the world around us. Speaking half a century ago, Scholar, preacher, and pastor George Buttrick in his comments on this text said, we know that we need the power of the same spirit that touched those at Pentecost in our lives today. We know that nothing can change the world. Nothing can make it into the kind of world that God intends for it to be, but by some intrusion, by a power greater than anything the world itself contains. And it is the particular task of the church to present opportunities for the spirit to break through. He also said that's easier said than done. In writing decades ago, but sounding like he could be writing today, he noted that the church too often gets themselves tied up in concerns about finances and forgets that their main reason for existence is mission, Jesus' way of love. He reflected that too many churches get so set in their ways and so tied to doing things the way they've always been done, they lock out the spirit as if they were encased in bulletproof armor. In fact, he said, too many churches get so comfortable in who they are, they forget the needs of the world, the very needs that our faith most calls us to respond to. Not too long ago, I was reading an article about a group of young Christians who decided to live in community in Philadelphia in a really run-down neighborhood. 
and they described what they see as a problem of traditional Christianity. They said that the church focuses more on life after death than on proving the quality of life before death. They focus too much time on fire insurance. The leader of this group, Shane Claiborne, he said, don't get me wrong, I'm excited about the afterlife, and yet I am convinced that Jesus came not just to prepare us to die, but to teach us to live. And he tells us that the kingdom of God is within each and every one of us, among us at hand. And we're to pray as we do each week when we say the Lord's Prayer, that it comes on earth as it does in heaven. And he goes on to say, no wonder the early church was called the way, because it was a way of life that stood in glaring contrast to the world. Yet people were attracted to it. They were ready for something different. They were ready to turn away from violence. They were ready to make sure that people had what they needed in order to have fulfilling lives. So I ask you today, are you ready for something different? You know, each of us has that Pentecost power of the Holy Spirit within us, waiting to be fired up and unleashed. And the power of the Spirit's not found in our programs or our buildings, but in the loving actions of a faithful community. And we have the power to lock it in and turn our backs to the Spirit or let her burst forth and fire us up to live lives that are inspired and directed towards changing the world. Not just because we're good people, but because we're followers of Jesus Christ empowered by the Spirit. Very shortly, we're going to baptize Lily, our newest member of the church. And as she is symbolically plunged into the waters of Jesus' death and resurrection, anointed by the power of the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own forever, she is going to be changed by that same power that came down on that first Pentecost. And her parents and godparents, you are going to help her realize the unique gifts and potential that will help her live into the promises that you are going to make for her today. The same promises that all of us are going to recommit ourselves to shortly. And so today, friends, at Pentecost and with baptism, these are reminders for each of us of who we are and to whom we belong and that we too are a changed people, a resurrection people, a Pentecost people, and that we can and must continue the process of transformation, renewed by the power of the Spirit, and renounce that which does not give us life or bring the reign of God closer. So this Pentecost, hope presses on through you, through me, through Lily, even when our world does not seem all that hopeful. And so as we move into summer and begin to plan for our future in worship, with pilgrimage and formation and small groups and Bible study and outreach, I invite you to revisit the Holy Spirit in Pentecost in a serious way because we are poised in a place to open ourselves just in incredible ways to God's Spirit. What new dreams can we dream into being together? How can we tap into some of the new energy that's been emerging here at St. John's? How can we bring Pentecost to life again, not just today, but moving forward? So today, I challenge each one of you here to invite the Spirit in anew, to fill you with new passion and excitement. And I want you to email me and let me know 
What excites you about the work of the church? What excites you about St. John's? And where you think God is calling you to use the gifts that the Spirit has given you? So don't get too comfortable and hold on to your pews because the Holy Spirit is fired up and ready to breathe a breath of fresh air into each of us. And as she does, let us together with Lily Morgan and her family to affirm the promises we made to live as Christ's disciples in the world. Now I invite Lily and her godparents to come forward. <laughs> 